Jedi Survivor is the latest Star Wars action game developed by Respawn Entertainment, and this is my critique of it. This video does not contain any spoilers, and all subtitles have been turned off. Enjoy, and I'll see you guys on the other side. Jedi Survivor kicks off five years after the original, where Jedi in hiding Cal Kestis was discovered by the Empire on the planet Bracca following the Great Jedi Purge. Cal manages to escape the planet with the help of Seer and ultimately ventures out to locate the Jedi Holocron before it falls into the hands of Trilla, the game's excellent Inquisitor villain. So we kick Trilla's ass, Vader shows up, Cal destroys the Holocron, he escapes, and the game ends. The next game begins and Cal has been captured and is being led into Coruscant. We don't know why he's been captured or how it went down or where his companions are. In fact, very little information is given as to why the Fellowship of Marin, Seer, and Grease fell apart outside some terse chit-chat with Marin about halfway through the game. Something had to happen. After all, they went through some crazy times together and they're really close friends, so for them to leave each other so abruptly points to something significant. And then what, you're gonna go find some trouble with Saw Gerrera? Maybe. Yeah, one of us has to keep fighting. That's funny. That's the exact same thing you said the day we all split up. Yeah, because I... When Grease and Cal reunite underneath the cantina, they have this heartfelt moment where Grease asks why it took so long for Cal to find him after the group split. So clearly something's there. Marin's location is unknown, and Seer cut ties with Cal as well. This alludes to a major falling out of sorts, and later on we get a little bit more information. This idea that Cal was so intent on destroying the Empire that perhaps it took them down a road that they couldn't all go. It seems like something bad happened due to his rashness for justice. This thread, though, isn't explored enough to corroborate the full picture, but I have to assume that the gray areas will be fleshed out in the next game. I hope so, anyway. I can understand saving some of the fine details for a future title, but I would have liked this mystery to be revealed a little bit more in this game because it is a branch that hangs over Cal for pretty much the entire game. And a lot of the character development in this game stems from moments of unresolved tension between the friends. Perhaps it was mentioned in an artifact I didn't find, but I usually don't go out of my way to read in video games too much, so as it stands, I still have no idea why the team split up between the two games. Anyway, as Cal's being transported to Coruscant, part of me wondered why he didn't just use his force powers to break his bonds, kill the guards, and escape with the aircraft. Which is why I wasn't exactly surprised when it turned out that it was all a front to get Cal inside Coruscant, confront the senator, and capture classified Imperial data. This was a really entertaining and engaging tutorial level, and I really liked the design of Senator Doho, or Doho, I don't remember. His voice work is impeccable, and I appreciate games that aren't afraid to put in the effort to do a character to the best of their ability, knowing that they don't even really have to. I mean, this guy's gonna die in 45 minutes anyway. Games have strict budgets, and you can't delay a game forever, so some things need more prioritization than others. But characters really shouldn't be one of those things when a game is story and character-based. We've all seen the lengths this industry will go to cut corners, and this guy with his less than five minutes of actual screen time could have easily been an area where the teams just said, fuck it, we gotta cut costs somewhere, let's just do it right here and right now. In fact, nearly all the character work and designs and voice works in this game is really top notch, which is surprising considering the conservative nature of its casting. I mean, how much benefit does the game actually receive by hiring Kevin Spacey to voice a character? I'm pretty sure the $8 million he got paid to voice in Call of Duty could have been used to make the rest of the game better in basically every single department. I think some error was made in regards to developing an interesting villain, however. Without a doubt, Trilla was a fantastic antagonist in Fallen Order. In fact, I think she's the best villain in any Star Wars game, eclipsing the rather one-dimensional anti-hero in Dagon. Dagon's entire character is pretty generic, and he mostly just whines and cries about how the Jedi didn't listen to him, so he turns to the dark side all of a sudden and plans to take over the galaxy because he didn't get his way. If I told you that was the story of my character, would you think that's very compelling? The motive just isn't very strong, and beyond that, he doesn't have any else going on. He's not funny, he's not nice, he's not really compassionate, he's just an evil mad whiny guy, and frankly it's hard to find any empathy for the guy. Trilla turned to the dark side because she had no way out. She was hunted down and when they found her she fought protecting her fellow Jedi. She was then tortured and forced to becoming the second sister. She's introduced within the first 15 minutes of the game in one of the most badass cutscenes ever. Her presence is palpable, she's constantly brought into the key moments of the game, she has thoughtful dialogue with Cal throughout. She's a fantastic boss fight as well, 
ultimately meeting her demise in one of the great surprises of the game. She's exactly what you want in any game, a terrifying, multidimensional, yet somehow relatable and present villain. Dagon is not a terrible character, he's just serviceable and I think that's the issue. When you're following a badass villain like Trilla, you really have some big shoes to fill. He's also just not around very much. We don't meet Dagon until hour three, and he's only in a few cutscenes of the game. Trilla has far more screen time and dialogue and her performance, and most importantly, her screen presence is so much stronger. I actually think Ravis is a far more interesting character than Dagon. His design is super eye-catching and his voiceover is intimidating, but he's barely used. They could have done a lot with him, and though his boss fight is pretty good, I think he mostly goes to waste. Surely it's subjective, but perhaps the issue is that by having two villains means developing two different character arcs when there's only enough playtime for one. Ultimately, both end up feeling rather forgettable, which is traditionally why most games only have one main villain, I suppose. There's just not enough time to introduce, feature, and grow multiple villains, especially when your game time runs only about 20 hours. Of course, not being the first level acts as the game's intro, and I think the game does a pretty good job entertaining the player while teaching them the core systems of combat and platforming. One thing games have struggled with over the years is making tutorials engaging, or more than just plastering walls of text over the screen. Boring ass tutorials have likely caused a lot of refunds over the last five years. It's better to keep things brief and use progressive difficulty and actual combat challenges that move the level forwards, which it does, rather than risk the player falling asleep or ripping them out of the present game space like the combat training simulation with the biochip in Cyberpunk 2077. Although inspired by Dark Souls, Cal's franchise appeals to a far more casual market and doesn't need to start with a Ludix gun deer fight or have a long-winded boring introduction. The Prisoner March certainly overstays its welcome. I could understand wanting the player to get immersed in the city, but a forced walking simulation is hardly the best way to go about doing this. Thankfully, Coruscant is one hour at best, and it teaches how to play the game without frustrating the player too much, while in tandem developing the new character of Bo Dakuna. Outside of briefly pausing to tell you how to use things, it does a great job disguising Coruscant as the actual tutorial, which, let's be honest, it is, and this is how it should be. Cal learns how to grapple, wall run, climb, fight, and jump, while light character growth occurs between Cal and Bode with the use of banter and assisted platforming sections. It's cinematic, it's exciting, it's a good introduction to any video game. It's also nice to see Cal as, again, a Jedi who's entirely capable, but not overly powerful, which was how he was portrayed in the original game. Cal is more mature in this game, but he's still the grounded character we use back in Fallen Order. One really cool thing they showcase is how Cal can be helped by his partners, like Bode's jetpack and later Marin's teleportation, as a means of helping Cal over obstacles, and this is a way of reinforcing Cal's humanity without actually saying it. This happens continually throughout the game, such as when you first go to Jedi with Marin. As Cal is climbing up the structure, he has to watch helpless as Marin assassinates three stormtroopers before he can even reach her. It's a small detail that showcases Cal's limits as a Jedi, and that's really important to his character. Several more times we see Cal relying on his friends. Marin saves Cal with the use of her portals, BD-1's Electro Dart is essential for Cal moving forward in levels. In fact, using Bode and Marin as companions for most of the game with their extensive screen time and long interactive gameplay sections undercuts the overarching narrative beautifully, which is having to rely on friends in the face of a great evil. Cal cannot defeat the Empire on his own like he thought he could before Jedi Survivor, and this feeling of learning and understanding and coming together pervades the experience without Cal coming across too weak on his own. And as a result, I felt even more drawn to Cal than the first game. He's intelligent, but he's not a genius. He's a great fighter, but you need the help of your friends. He knows the Force very well, but he struggles against the dark side and he has his equals. He does a lot of damage, but he can't shoot lighting out of his eyes. The sensation of his power is gradual with the use of the expanded skill trees, and the stances are given out in tandem with major story beats and discoveries. All the while, the general vibe of being a survivor amidst an Imperial manhunt remains, staying true to Cal's story without flying off the rails into unnecessary plot territory. In fact, the game is extremely focused in general, even though it's far more open, spanning no more than 20 hours with exciting story, with much better level design and a heap of improvements on nearly everything Fallen Order provided. The pacing of the game has been shifted from small, numerous Metroidvania planets, though let's be honest and call them levels, they were pretty small, into a cross-play of open environments followed by linear worlds with similar on-rail set pieces. I can best describe the sensation of playing this game to Metro Exodus, where you follow a similar code, semi-open world area followed by tightly controlled linear story beats, then a bit of exploration to push your story forwards, then back to a semi-open area and repeat. In Jedi Survivor, you have two main worlds to explore, Jeddah and Koba, and when you advance the story, it sends you to other locations, or sometimes parts of those planets, 
or in more linear sections of weight such as the Shattered Moon Base or the Forest Array. You'll combat the challenge, fight the boss and acquire whatever item you need to, and generally be sent back to the galaxy map for your next objective which will be either on Jeddah or Koba. In the middle of that process, you can explore the two planets, which don't really function the way they used to. There's much less of the I don't have this item I'll come back later thing, and more of if I want to do some optional stuff on Jeddah, I'll just go over there and do it. Pull up your map, check for undiscovered yellow areas, and just, just go do it. You may run into a barrier you can't dash through or a door you can't open, but it has nowhere near the degree of metroidvania stuff as its predecessor. The levels that are linear traditionally function as forward moving levels as opposed to open door now what happens. Levels can be designed in any way and we often think of metroidvania games as being sort of directionless as the game is branch like or spider webby and those paths may lead to even more paths and more locked off areas and such. Especially when the map of a game has a fog of war or a compass system that only reveals the map when you have that item equipped. Take one look at the map of Hollow Knight and it's pretty clear that this game has absolutely no relationship with Jedi Survivor at all. On the other side of the coin, Jedi Survivor's maps give you just about everything you need not to get lost, from color coding available areas to those that are blocked off and indicating where your main objective is even though you haven't explored that area yet. You rarely, if ever, are confused on where to go because the path always seems to keep you moving forwards too. It's not just about the map. When you have a forward moving level, you have a smooth play experience. This is one of the things that I don't really actually like about Metroidvania games. I enjoy the exploration, but I I don't exactly like the stoppy startiness of it all. You know, you enter a room, you see four ways to proceed, and you have to stop and ask yourself where you should go. You pause, you open the map, you fiddle with things, and then you figure out what you need to do just to keep moving forwards. Then you unpause, you spin around a few times, check your compass, and walk in the direction you have chosen. This is sort of a quirk in Metroidvania games, and this happened a lot in Fallen Order for me, adding up to a lot of my time spending idle or running in circles, mostly because the level design was fairly messy. For as terrific a game as it was, it was pretty confusing to kind of navigate your way around the levels. It often wasn't clear how things were connected, shortcuts weren't prioritized enough, and sliding down the wrong path might end you up in an area where you couldn't go back to where you were. Heavy amounts of pointless backtracking ensued, and the lack of fast travel made it double frustrating. This often crashed the momentum of the game as you had to constantly fumble with the map and your general sense of direction, but Jedi Survivor fixes this by having less paths and more continuity in how its environments support its shortcuts. Typically the main path is very clear and distinguished and will always take you to your objective, so it's less common to get lost and have to stop every 15 seconds. There's also fewer side rooms and optional fork in the road moments where you have to choose between multiple paths within the same path, and shortcuts constantly reinforce your direction and create easy transportation back to meditation points. The game rarely, if ever, asks you to turn around and find some other way around, and that's a huge, huge distinguishing factor between the two games. And the really ironic part is that Jedi Survivor has intra-level fast traveling, meaning you can warp to any save spot from any other save spot within a level, when it doesn't even need it. The shortcuts connect areas so thoroughly, and areas rarely ever have backtracking, that I was never warping between meditation points while I was going through individual levels. It's only when you want to come back later and find something you missed that the fast travel is actually useful, or when you need to get to a different part of a larger planet. I have to assume the prioritization of streamlining the level design was pursued because the game knows if you want to scratch your exploration itch, it has plenty of that with its semi-open world planets, creating less of a need for it in its linear ones. This allows the expanded platforming sections inside the main stories to be far more fluid and fun because the game knows it's catering to both crowds regardless. It's very nice to feel like you're being guided by an invisible hand, especially in a game that does not have a minimap. This turns out to be why Jedi Survivor's world design is so superb, because it functions without a hitch despite ditching the greatest contrivance in modern gaming, the follow me quest arrow. This should be the goal of any linear video game, without making players feel like they're choked into a corridor or glued into that little box in the corner of the screen, which can turn players into potato zombies as the beautiful scenery passes them by. There's nothing worse than playing a game where you're feeling like you have to glance at that minimap arrow every 10 seconds, or worse, are so dependent on it that you spend more time looking at it than the actual game itself. Not because you want to, but because the game has trained you to. I have to imagine it's much more difficult to make a cohesive small level without these handicaps than making a huge buffet level with endless icon confetti because you're not only required to understand how the level connects in the most concise way possible, 
but you're also forced to build something so well that the player can play through it without those crutches. And if there was one thing Jedi Survivor does much better than Fallen Order, it's making its levels far more engaging and less confusing to play through. The shortcut design in its linear sections is superb, while still offering the find all the shiny things carrots with the use of its expanded world maps. Honestly, it's the best of both worlds, because as someone who is solely focused on the story most of the time, my experience is significantly improved when I'm not having to figure out what the level designer was intending to do but failed while I'm playing the game. I found the balance to be extremely refreshing too as you get this excellent mix of pacing between rising soul reaction within the linear levels and peaceful exploration and downtime in the big planets without feeling like the game was trying to accomplish both at once affecting the general pace of play and without feeling like the world is out to scare you with an endless amount of playtime. I despise games that purposefully try to get you to enter this feeling of obnoxious FOMO. It's an annoying and frankly stressful sensation that plagues many games that try to do the open world thing. Because it's tempting to cram a game full of crap where you get so tired that you eventually burn out and quit far before you beat the game. But the planets in Jedi don't have endless icons and pointless collectibles. There aren't a thousand outposts you need to clear. They're not stuffed with side quest markers, errands, or any of the typical bitch work you see in a Ubisoft game. Yes, there's a lot of empty open space, but there's no annoying grinding, checklists, level gating, or arbitrary roadblocks just to piss you off. In fact, there's no hovering quest icons at all that may remind you of the lethargy in modern gaming. You know, the ones that you see floating above an NPC telling you that they got a side quest for you? In this game, you actually have to walk up and talk to people and see if they have something for you to do. Sometimes they got a quest for you, sometimes they don't. I like this a lot because it doesn't feel forced and you never feel overburdened with a laundry list of things to do. If you want to divert from the story, you have to interact with the world and go out and do it. If you don't, then the game says that's cool too, as opposed to trying to mentally block out all the graffiti. And this is extremely important to keep the story moving forward and make sure the average player doesn't burn out. You can do it all or nothing. The greatest design choice is that experience doesn't dictate your power. There is no level system in Jedi Survivor. You don't level up. You level a bar to get a skill point, not a stat boost. Think about that for a second. In games that have level systems, almost always your base power increases at each level. But in this game, there is no power boosting and the player has no statistics. Cal does the same damage with his lightsaber with zero skill points spent, versus a fully maxed out skill tree. This lets you feel a sensation of power, which is important. We all want to feel like we're growing in power as we get new skills without being too strong or too weak should you fall behind. You can beat the entire game without spending a single skill point, which allows the developers to balance the game properly, knowing every player has the same attack power and enough health to withstand any attack in the game, regardless of how much content the player does. What a relief it is to play a game where the progress of it and the mastery of it is based on your skill sets, not dictated by how much time you spend in it, but how good you are at it. One element that was a bit of a letdown though was the lack of environmental variety. Fallen Order had seven planets with five of them being fully explorable, covering the standard brown, blue, green, and white levels seen in basically every game ever made. Jedi Survivor on the other hand feels like it doesn't have the same amount of variety even though it is larger. The galaxy in this game consists of Jeddah and Koba as the game's main planets which are hybrid open worlds and two smaller planets used for story progression. The other two planets are Coruscant, which acts as the game's introduction as I stated earlier, and you never really come back to it, and Tantalor, which doesn't really count because it doesn't have anything in it. So that pretty much leaves you with four options, which wouldn't be so bad if not for the fact that each pair kinda sort of feels maybe the same. Jedi and Koba have similar desert-like terrain, and I would lump them into the category of orange level, and Nova and Shattered are both imperial military bases of sorts, and you could put those into the category of sort of gray indoor levels. The two large planets have various areas that do contain some environmental diversity, a forest, a swamp, the array, but most of the terrain is brown, desert, and awfully similar. It's surprising not to see a lush blue or green world, or snow or rain or anything like that, and I think one of the things that really kind of stood out to me the most is that the world that has the most imagination and, and the most creative look to it, which is Tantalor, doesn't have anything in it whatsoever, so it's really not a planet. So it's a little bit of a letdown in that department, but it's really not that bad because the levels themselves are so much better in Fallen Order that it's crazy. They're so much better because the platforming mechanics have been expanded upon greatly, making Jedi Survivor feel a lot more whimsical and fun than the original. One change that people may not have realized is that Cal can now scale the walls he runs on. 
In Fallen Order, it was impossible to jump when you were doing a wall run and land safely back on the wall to continue your platforming sequence. But in Jedi Survivor, Cal can actually do this and it allows him to basically scale walls while he's running them. You can do this by jumping off the wall and holding the stick in the direction of the wall and then just jump back towards it. This is important to allow players to self-correct. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I died on wall runs in the original, which dramatically slowed down the pace of the game for me. It's just a little unfortunate that this title's pressure-sensitive jump can create some guess games in this capacity though. Cal has two options for jumping depending on how hard you press the jump and how long you hold it. The difference is basically like a bunny hop versus a full jump. You can then perform another jump afterwards in midair, and I think the problem is in regards to this double jumping mechanic. There's a little bit of latency built up between the two jumps. This is necessary as the game has to detect whether you're going to spend the extra few nanoseconds holding down the button to jump a little bit higher. If you release the button and then hit jump again in order to double jump, the game might not register it because the small lag window exists. So what ends up happening is that you try to execute a high jump, release the button, and then high jump again, expecting Cal to double high jump, but the second jump actually doesn't come out. This is the exact same thing I talked about in my Mass Effect Andromeda video regarding Ryder's double jump and how it was very, very difficult to tell if you were actually going to be allowed to do that second jump. It is not as big of an issue in Jedi Survivor, but I did want to point it out because there were a few moments where it caused me to meet my untimely death. Still, the game is very enjoyable for platforming and it has extensive sequences of platforming which take advantage of Cal's new mobility options. Cal is required to do some pretty long, complex jump sequences in this game once he gets his full kit, which you'd expect for a game to do. But keep in mind the distance Cal can cover with his tools can be very, very far especially with those damn balloons which you can launch off like a rocket ship, so this requires a lot of work on the part of the development team. The more distance Cal travels means the more world they have to create for any given moment of platforming. Creating these large play spaces for Cal while at the same time making sure not to disrupt the coherency of the pathways was a tremendous challenge and I'm happy to say Respawn really did a great job with Jedi Survivor. At no point does the platforming impede on your ability to navigate the terrain. In fact, it all syncs up very nicely and this was a big surprise for me. It was also really nice to see so much more utilization with his tools and in such a high frequency. In a game like Uncharted 4, Nathan has various options for a rope swing, sliding, climbing, and using his baton, and those provide an excellent canvas for some creative and fun platforming sequences. But the game was so stingy with them. It wasn't until the very end of the game that it actually asked you to link all of your options together in a complex sequence. And by that time, the game was basically over. You have to assume the game features mostly isolated platforming challenges featuring just one or two of his skills because of the tremendous cost of making that sort of extensive platforming content. But Jedi Survivor is very, very generous and gives you tons of mixed gameplay in an ever-increasing series of trials, ending on some really awesome sections that test your timing and accuracy. My favorite planet by far was a Shattered Moon base, which I felt like I was scaling an actual Imperial base with its awesome platforming challenges, perfectly placed zipline shortcuts, and hazards like the pulsating energy beam. The best word I can use to describe how the player moves through this planet is just fluid. It's, it's flowy, it's super super duper fluid. They really nailed the amount of time you spent platforming and exploring the offshoot pathways and the game spent with combat. It has a really nice flow to it because let's be honest, finding the right proportions of different styles of game content and mechanics is often the death kneel for games of this type. The design is such a 180 from the first game that you really feel like a shift in level design was an absolute priority from the development team. Things flow so well that you won't even need to use your hollow map for most of the game, even though it's easier to use and has seen various upgrades, like the trace outlines for your previous footsteps. This is a very nice feature and something I would like to see in way more games, making for a seamless and fun and most importantly, much more grand experience without feeling overly frustrating or difficult. The downside though to mostly timing-based platforming is that you don't get a lot of mechanical interaction with the player. One thing I would like to see from a sequel is to move away from the tap the button at the right time to a system that may require some degree of aiming. Really outside of Cal's jump, none of the traversal mechanics depend on the accuracy of the player, so it's often the case of is the player within range of the grapple hook points or not. Exofer, did the player jump at the right time or not? This gets taken to an extreme with some of the more optional platforming challenges. In normal play, some sections require Cal to reposition in midair before jumping in another direction, but it typically always ends in, did Cal get within range of the next grapple point? If yes, hit L2 and Cal finishes the obstacle automatically. If no, you fall to your death. 
This isn't inherently bad game design, it's actually really smart. Because Jedi Survivor is an action game, so having most of the focus on basic timed platforming helps the game keep a good sense of speed and accessibility. After all, if you have your timing down right, you technically never need to stop moving. If aiming were involved, or Cal had a rope like Nathan Drake, it would risk grinding the game to a halt as players have to stop for the sake of, you know, precision. But at the same time, let's be real, the platforming in Jedi Survivor is not great for a New Game Plus situation. Unlike combats, which can unfold in so many different ways, the platforming can pretty much only be accomplished the one way the developer envisioned. While it may look nice and flashy, it's ultimately not much different than a long, quick time button sequence. I think it's perfectly at home in this game, but it's not like we can't take it to the next level with a sequel with an emphasis put on, if not more complicated, but at least more intricate mechanical platforming. Now gameplay has seen a lot of enhancements from Fallen Order, but there is some tidying up to do for the next game as well. Jedi Survivor has a typical third person lock on action combat system. You can attack, block, dodge, jump, parry, use force powers, manipulate certain enemies, use skills like throwing your lightsaber, doing various combos, and slowing down time. The game has no stamina system, which sets it apart from the game that ultimately inspired its combat system, which means you can use normal attacks and Cal's jump and dodge as many times as you want without penalty. Instead, Cal has a force meter which is used as a resource for all of his force powers and, this is really important, all of his special attacks. This bar refills over time as Cal does damage to enemies or if he has the flux perk activated. This is in theory a very good system as it forces the player to consider what skills to use while remaining conscientious of the meter. Conscientious? Is that a word? Uh, we're gonna go with it. But it can also be quite limiting considering all of the other saber skills fall into the category of these special attacks. Using things like lunge strike, overhead strike, or saber throw consume large quantities of force, which on one hand makes combat fairly tactical as you have to constantly check in on your force meter, but it can also limit the variety of play. Because if you use your meter for force skills, then guess what you don't have meter for? Your actual force powers. I feel like the developers may have felt constrained due to primarily it being a controller friendly game. Every single button is already taken up, so perhaps they felt forced into squeezing two buttons into one. Mapping out all the controls on a controller is actually one of the things that designers spent a long time on. Because the force meter is required for basically all your attacks except your basic, you know, your basic swings, you do feel a little bit shackled to that R1 button. And I think if nothing else, a 15% flat decrease to the cost of all of your special attacks will go a long way opening up the battlefield for those of us who want to express our creativity more. Because you want to feel like a badass, right? You, I mean, we're playing a Star Wars game here. I mean, I get it. We're playing a Dark Souls inspired game here where it's <laughs> things were historically very slow and Cal's a very grounded character. Character, so what they created was actually quite appropriate. But I mean, come on guys, just be a little bit more generous, okay? And that's something a patch could easily fix. But the real reason I droned on a little bit right there was because some of the enemies feel like they've been designed to be tackled with specific attacks, okay? The game expands upon the base combat system with the introduction of the stance system, which sees three additional saber stances added. Dual wield, blaster, and cross guard, in addition to single hand and double blade. First and foremost, this is very generous considering a lot of sequels do the bare minimum. One additional stance probably would have been enough. But we get a total of five and every stance plays different. And the fact that this game was inspired by a combat system where you do hit R1 for the majority of your playtime, you have to commend the effort. But I think the issue is that you're limited to just two stances at a time and the game encourages you to stick to them. This is evident in the fact that by the time you beat the game, considering you did not go out of your way to free farm, on average, you'll have enough skill points to fully max out two saber skill trees maybe one force tree and have a few points left over to dump into, increasing Cal's health and his stims. But that's it. You can respec at any time by spending one points, which can easily be acquired, but you're still only going to have enough for two, maybe three stances and keep that in mind as I continue to talk about this point. Of course, completionists will get every single skill points, but the majority of players will not. I mention this because at no point will you have access to all the skills in the trees and you'll only have two saber stances active at one time. This results in you being prepared for some enemies, but not all of them, and that's the point. For example, Imperial probe droids are best dealt with the blaster stance. 
They're resistant to force pull and they're very difficult to hit with normal swings, even when you're jumping. So if you don't have the blaster stance equipped, fighting them can be very annoying. This is why I mentioned that it may not have been the right call to tie all of Cal's special attacks to his force meter. There will be a time where you're fighting multiple enemies, turn to the probe droid pelting you from above like a little annoying fucker and want to throw your lightsaber at it, but you glance down and your force meter is empty. So you sit there like an idiot, trying to jump and flail like a monkey to try to kill them. Meanwhile, you're getting shot in the ass from three different stormtroopers behind you, and then this guy with this electric baton smacks you in the side of the head, and you fall to the ground. It's really annoying. In Fallen Order, these probe joys can be force-pulled for easy kills, and you can even hijack them with BD-1. But here it's a crapshoot if you have the stance or the resources to deal with these incredibly annoying enemies quickly. An option to alleviate this somewhat messy combat design would be to allow Cal to use any stance at any time. This would free up his options to deal with specific challenges, such as how shield gunners can be killed easiest by swapping to your double blade and ricocheting blaster rounds back at them. I do not think though this would be the best solution because it would be far too many options however. It's already difficult to keep track of all your button combinations you have for just one of your stances, let alone two. Stances have a lot of attacks and the attack types for various button combinations are not exactly universal. For example, holding triangle is a defensive option when you're dual wielding, but an offensive option when rocking the single blade. And if you're using a blaster, it could be a crowd control function. And those are three very, very different attack functions using the same universal inputs. It's second nature when swapping to a weapon in any game to use the same button for the same attack type, regardless of that weapon. We are trained through muscle memory. If you do that in this game, you'll typically be punished immediately if it's not. So having four or even three active stances would have been honestly way too complicated and overwhelming, considering each stance has multiple attacks, combos, different cancel options, different parry options, and multiple hold combos for attacks like R1 plus triangle or L1 plus triangle. Now factor in Cal's force powers, which can also have their own different hold and press commands, as well as delay attacks like press square, wait, and then press square again, or wait, hold it, and now a combo comes out, and you can see how things could be far too confusing for the average Joe if they set it up this way. Especially in a game that focuses on large groups of varied enemies with different ranges, unblockable attacks, and delay attacks instead of focusing on one-on-one -on -one fighting. And a game that does not have any flashing attack indicators or audio cues for off-screen attacks. Cal has plenty of options to control the battlefield, but in practice, it seldom works out as good as you imagine it would. Thus, perhaps two stances is the right call, but then you don't have everything you need at the moment, which begs the question if Cal's special attacks should indeed be tied to his force meter or not. Regardless, the combat was something I was almost always enjoying because the game leans heavily into parries and mixed gameplay with all the new stance options. Few games feature guard breaking, and it's obvious much inspiration was drawn from Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. In Jedi Survivor, the most effective strategy isn't to block or dodge, but breaking guards. You can use force pull on stormtroopers, but strong enemies require parries as it opens up the best window for free damage. A lot of enemies have a guard meter that must be broken for you to damage their colored health bar. You can mash the attack button and it will chip the uh, meter down. But it will take a lot of time and nearly every serious enemy will attack through your attacks so it's kind of risky. This results in you taking free damage because there's no option to cancel your basic attacks unless you are dual wielding. Enemies have extremely predictive AI in this game and it almost seems like they can read your inputs like you're fighting Goro in Mortal Kombat. So it's best to play patiently and react. Sekiro feels like it encourages more aggression because of pushback and a higher hit stun, but Jedi Survivor tends to punish you for being too wild as enemies often just straight up ignore what you're doing. This is quite problematic when switching weapons as there are no stance switching attacks unlike Fallen Order, and you can easily get caught in the animation of switching weapons even against the most basic enemies. I do miss stance switching attacks. They were very practical, and the cool thing was you could do stance switching in between your basic autos, or even while sprinting. There are far less attacks in Fallen Order, but ironically there are more extended combos despite the small move list thanks to stance switching. And these combos are very comfortable. Executing an elaborate combo like this between two stances is not possible in Jedi Survivor. I mean, you'll never use it, but at least the opportunity is there and it looks pretty damn cool.
In Jedi Survivor, there is no stance switching. You have to manually switch stances, and it resets your character when you do so, making sword combat between stances way more stiff. The fact that you can't cancel any attacks also makes it less fluid. Canceling an attack just means you're backing out of an attack that you're about to do by hitting dodge, usually, a mechanic featured in many, many games. This gives you a safety net in case the attack you inputted was a mistake and you're about to get hit, so you cancel it by dodging and voila, you're safe. Not possible in Jedi Survivor, meaning if you hit an attack, you are committing to that attack no matter what. Any game that features this mechanic will have its pace slow down significantly since you can't fly around the screen anytime you feel like it, and naturally, you get punished for errors more. Most people believed that you could not cancel attacks in Fallen Order, but that was only half true. If you were using the double blade, you could step cancel out of an attack by quickly hitting dodge. You can thread this very, very close to Cal winding up to his strike. You could not only cancel your first auto, but you could also cancel any attack in the chain. But this was only possible using the Darth Maul stance. But since there were only two weapons in Fallen Order, theoretically that meant you could cancel normal attacks about half the time if you were fast enough. Along with seamless stance switching, it made for a very snappy combat system. Jedi Survivor, on the other hand, is a little less quick on its feet. Attacks lock you into place mostly, and we have to use a D-pad to switch weapons now, which is and has always been an uncomfortable trend that should have died with Dark Souls 1. Because if you're using a controller, which most people are, and you reach over and hit the D-pad, you give up controlling either your camera or your character, which always sucks. I have to assume the new stances cause the removal of stance switching. With five stances comes the need to create five new combo strings that have to be motion capped, animated, programmed into the game code, with all the work that goes into making any attack string functional, like hit detection, collision masks, and clipping and balance. Perhaps they thought being able to have more stance options would make up for it, but in reality, you're limited to two at any time, so I'm not sure the trade-off was worth it. The best combination of the two games would have been a complete synergy of the new stance system with the old link options, so Cal can remain as responsive at all times, have more combo potential and feel more in control of difficult situations. Not to mention the most important elements, it would allow Cal potentially to have more active stances with the use of simple button combinations. And I'm just spitballing here with absolutely no script right now, but what about just the basic combination of triangle plus square? You press them at the same time, and a stance switch attack happens. Currently, this simple button combination is not used at all in the game. Once again though, as I discussed earlier with so many button combinations already present in the game, we're talking about possibly landing in the spots where the move list in Jedi Survivor equates to something of like Tekken 7 at this point. Which if you've seen the Tekken 7 move list, uh, yeah, Alt F4. So at that point, you might want to scratch this idea and go back to your original concept, which was to hold square for a stance switching attack, since that's the easiest button combination for someone to remember, and you can make that universal across all stances. But then you realize holding square or holding triangle already are taken up by other attacks that have been added into Jedi Survivor. So you have this entire problem that is easiest solved by, all right, let's just give the player more stances, but only let them have two active at the same time, and you can't switch between them with any link attacks. Which lands us precisely where we are in Jedi Survivor. You know, sometimes as gamers, it's really easy to be like, oh, why didn't they just add this? Or why didn't they just do this? And if we dig into things a little bit more deeply, maybe we can understand why sometimes it's not as easy as it sounds because a lot has to be taken in consideration for a video game, especially accessibility for uh, controls and such. And if you have a ton of overlapping systems, there will come a point where you have to make some compromises. And hopefully that will happen at the beginning of the design phase. But even still, at the end of the road, when you make those choices, you're going to have some people that are disappointed and some people that are happy. That's why games don't appeal to everyone. You just have to make the choice that you think is best for your game and you live with the consequences. Anyway, end of tangents, let's continue. Without stance switching, you have this moment of idle nothingness where you can easily get tagged by a stray attack, since, well, you can't exactly move. There are some fairly ghetto ways to get around this by hitting the weapon change button in the middle of an attack string, but it doesn't link. I've tried it, trust me. You can also do some slum style combos in midair and kind of land in a different stance if you're using the same technique, but that's pretty much it, and even then it barely works.
At absolute best, in an actual fight, you'll get off this type of sequence between two different stances. It's not a natural link, and it's not exactly comfortable. And that's one of the trade-offs for designing a combat system in this way. Furthermore, combat can get very problematic given the lack of player cues, especially when Cal reaches the end of his journey and the game throws six to eight enemies at you at one time. In a game like God of War, the player almost always has a secondary companion to stun or crowd control targets, such as Atreus and his bow, and his shape-shifting skills. In addition, the game has flashing indicators and great audio cues which warn you if you're going to be attacked off screen. The indicators even change colors depending on how soon it will happen. Something like this could have easily been introduced in Jedi Survivor because there's a lot of unblockable moves that come very fast in this game. And if you're again facing that Imperial probe droid trying to fuck around with them, they can easily come behind you. I found the game overall to be extremely easy on Jedi Knight difficulty, so I jacked it up to Jedi Master, but as soon as I got to late game, it became very annoying to deal with this super super short parry window and everything I just mentioned. I think Jedi Survivor plays extremely well. It's chonky, it's meaty, yet Cal is graceful. He has a huge array of options which is very welcome, and the combat executions are very stylish. It feels great overall, and it could have been even better if some more consideration was taken to Cal's resources and how the combat scenarios played out though. I guess ultimately I'm being a little bit hard on it because it can get very messy, but I'd be lying, definitely be lying if I didn't mutter, damn, this is awesome, after just about every combat encounter in this game. And honestly, besides my critique and my nitpicking, I found myself saying that about the entire game when it was all said and done. Jedi Survivor ultimately delivers a hell of fun adventure that everyone should try. It's the perfect size at 15 to 20 hours for me, and it has a great blend of linearity and openness. It doesn't alienate those who love the first game, but wanted more. In fact, it tries to meet you halfway by delivering extremely exciting story moments, followed by the choice to stop and smell the roses if you want to. It doesn't reinvent the wheel, in fact, it's mostly the same, but nearly everything has been improved in some capacity. It has an expanded combat system, better platforming, superior level design with none of the annoying backtracking, beautiful graphics, a great cast, and a story that does excite to the end. I was drawn in deeply to the entire game, and honestly, it was difficult to peel myself away. I think the pacing is damn near perfect. There's more enemies, better bosses, and most importantly, more Jedi and Imperial fighting as opposed to the absurd amount of fighting animals in Fallen Order. Day one New Game Plus, and a world with enough reason to be explored more than once for sure. It's a quality game that doesn't fuss around with all the things you know you hate. All those AAA trappings that are eking their way into some of the most prolific modern games these days. There's no stupid in-game store, no god-awful seasonal content, no fluff, no corner cutting, and definitely no corporate greed. Perhaps it was rushed out too soon, the performance does suck. But really, bad performance doesn't ruin an incredible game. Bad games can run at 500 frames and you couldn't pay me to play them. I'll take that trade any day in an era where you're lucky to get a great game in the first place. Jedi Survivor is a massive improvement on Fallen Order, and if they continue the trend, I don't see why the next Respawn Star Wars game can't be even better. Maybe rethink how combat resources work, give us some space combat and flying, add in another cool platforming gimmick, maybe make it a little bit more skillful this time, increase the environmental diversity a bit more, continue the great story, and you've got another banger of a game that I just can't wait to play. I just think it's an absolute priority to get the performance up to par next time because you risk alienating the people who support you on day one. It's a real shame that the performance was so shitty. I mean, I captured all this footage myself and even after multiple patches, my PS5 copy runs like absolute trash still. And it really did affect me and my play experience. It was aggravating and it was constant and I really never got used to it. I powered through it only because I thought I was going to review this game on day one. I got my review key and though I appreciate EA hooking it up, I didn't have the heart to review a game I really enjoyed, but would require me bashing living f out of it. I'm not about to recommend a game knowing the average frame rate on performance mode was toilet. I'm also not willing to even make the video because I'm not even sure who to blame. Is it the dev team, or is it a publisher who didn't give them enough time? How am I even supposed to know? This year has seen so many bad PC ports and bad performance games in general. I really hope to God it's not going to get any worse. Anyway, that's my critique of Jedi Survivor. I think it's an excellent video game that I hope you also got to play, and hopefully had a less annoying time with it than I did. Hope you guys enjoyed the video regardless, and thanks for watching. I'll see you later. Peace. The best way you guys can support this channel is heading over to patreon.com slash downwardthrust. Any and all donations are very much appreciated.